church, let's tell them this morning. Oh, there's nothing better than you. There's nothing better than you. There's nothing. Nothing is better than you. And I'm not afraid.
praise you. Come on, church, lift up your praise upon your mighty name. Oh, your healer, protector, deliverer, provider, savior, friend. All who can compare, who can compare to you, God. Oh, when the church sings that there's nothing better than you, there's nothing better than you, no, there's nothing, nothing is better than you. Come on, if you believe it, lift your voice. Oh, there's nothing better than you. Nothing is better than you. Come one more time from your heart to Jesus. Oh, there's nothing better than you. There's nothing better than you. There's nothing. Nothing is better. to my soul Who can spin the world around and hold me ever close Who can search the depths of me and love me to the core Controls the world I see and walks me through it all. No one but you. No. Just for I must pay my way with grace. Thank you, Lord. Love me through my darkest hour. A thousand different ways. No. Lift your hands and declare it.
Hear the oceans roar, see the skies light up every heart. Sing to the Lord. Come on, that's me and you. Hear the rocks cry out, see the mountains bow every heart. Worship the Lord. Come on, church. Yeah. The oceans roar, see the skies light up every heart. Sing to the Lord. Oh, we press in here. Cry out, see the mountains bow every heart. Every heart come, every heart. Shout a praise to Jesus in this place. It's moments like that that we live for. You know, we're we're worshipers. We're not performers. I mean, we perform, but uh, we're not Christian artists. We're worshiping priests and. We, we love singing songs, but we love tapping into moments like we just had where, you know, you can't, you can't create those. You encounter those, and um, it's really special. Um, <clears throat> before we go into this next song, I just want to share a verse with you. And it's out of Philippians chapter 2, verse 5. says, adopt the same attitude as that of Christ Jesus who existing in the form of God did not consider equality with God as something to be exploited. Instead, he humbled himself by assuming the form of a servant, taking on the likeness of mankind. And when he had come as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. And it's for this reason God highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name so that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow, every mountain will bow, every oppressor will bow, everything will bow 
and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. <laughs> you know, as we enter into this last song, I want us to think about the humility of Jesus and his sacrifice, especially in this Christmas season. That I mean, it blows my mind to think that the infinite God became an intimate human baby. That he came and became what he created. And like the wise men, like all of creation, like the faithful brothers and sisters past and present, we sing the simple song that says, here I am to worship in response to your amazing sacrifice and humility, Jesus. We love you.
upon the cross I'll never know how much it costs to see the sun. Come on church, let's lift our hands and sing that. And I'll never know how much Come on, stretch your hands out to God. Upon that cross, and I'll never know how much it costs to see my sin upon that cross. And I'll Thank you for your hope, your healing, your power. All those things, God, and the many, many more we can mention reduce us. No, that's not the right word. They elevate us to worshipers. You pull us up to the, the privilege of worship, just to declare with the angels with all of creation and with our brothers and sisters that are in heaven right now that you are God and that you are king. It's non-negotiable, undebatable, never to be changed, God. You rule. And so we agree with the stars of the universe. We agree with all the birds when they sing. We agree with the cries of infants. We agree with people all over the world right now that you are God. You are God. And you have sent the Christ the anointed and promised one. God, I pray for two words today. I pray for hope and I pray for healing. 
So many of us right now, Lord, need the hope of hanging on and believing and knowing you're moving and you're doing great things. So many of us, God, need our hearts touched and healing, our bodies touched, our heart, our minds touched, our spirits touched by your mighty hand. So I pray for that today. I bless and welcome all those, God, in prayer who are joining us online. I pray that your presence will be as powerful there as it is here. We thank you, Lord. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Yeah, good stuff. Feels like church, doesn't it? Okay, can you uh, give these guys a round of thank you and good morning, everybody online. It is great to see you. Uh, greetings, everyone. If I don't have the chance to know you, my name is Will Davis, Jr., and I have the pleasure of serving here as senior pastor. Uh, it's been a privilege for 20, almost 20-something, 20 28 years, I guess. If you're online, I want to greet you and welcome you. Um, anytime you want to connect to Austin Christian Fellowship, you can text the words ACF Connect to 512-866-9908. You can do that here in the room. You can do that out there. Um, we, we really do want uh, COVID or not meeting in person or not, not to have there be distance between us. So we can connect you to prayer, we can connect you to ministry opportunities, we can connect you to other Christians, we can connect you to serving. So please don't be, don't feel distant. We are right here and we'd love to be part of your life and your family and it's so great uh, to see you today. Okay, a couple of quick things I want you to be aware of. Christmas Eve service, it's that week, guys. Here we go, Christmas Eve service. It's Thursday, right? Is it Thursday? I mean to make sure I show up on the right day. It's Thursday. 4 p.m. here at Four Points, out there. We're gonna meet on the hillside in the grassy knoll, we call it. Uh, the weather is supposed to be 58 degrees and perfect. And so um, come, it's bring your own everything. Uh, blankets, fire pits, children, pets. It's that kind of Christmas Eve service, okay? And um, I will have a masked section and a mask optional section and we'll just let you guys sit as you want to. Just fill the hillside up, sing some carols, talk about hope, and then go home and, and watch what God does the rest of the weekend. It's gonna be just amazing. That's 4 p.m. this weekend, just one service. We also have an online Christmas Eve service you can stream online, because we can't stream that one. So you can watch one we've done online as well, just for you guys uh, that are online. Um, this is the last service of the year here at Four Points, and so do not show up or go online next week for church, because we will not be here. We always take the last weekend off, give our volunteers and staff the weekend off. So it's our last Sunday of the year, and we come back in January on the 4th, God willing, uh, with two services, okay? Uh, the first will be at the regular time, uh, and we'll continue to stream at 10, but at 9.15 and 9.30 here, and then the second one, 11.15, is mask optional. We're gonna ask for restaurant rules, which means you can wear it in, but take your mask off when you get in, and we think a lot of people can come to that as well, so we're gonna keep moving until the Lord tells us we can't, okay? It's gonna be fun, can't wait to see you guys, okay? We are in a series called There's Just Something About Christmas. And I wanted three different teachers to share with you kind of one of their nostalgic Christmas moments and what it means to you and them in the, teach, in the reality of Christmas right now. And so uh, two weeks ago, I got to tell you some realities in my life about Christmas. My, my wife spoke last week, did an amazing job. And today, our amazing and talented missions director, Michelle Briggins, who asked to teach back in March, couldn't do it, got shut down because of COVID, is going to share her story on Christmas and perspective today. And then as soon as the service is over here in the room, we're going to have some prayer for people that need it. And we'll pray for you guys as well. Would you please welcome my friend Michelle Briggins to the ACF stage? Woo! Thank you. Thank you. Woo, thank you, Will. How about that worship this morning, John David? You guys killed it. Merry Christmas, everybody. That is the first time I've gotten to say it this season. I usually am a curmudgeon and I'll wait till Christmas Eve, but Merry Christmas, are you feeling it? Are you beginning to feel the joy of the season? Four days, Christmas Eve, four days. The joy and the delight is, is starting to pop up all around us. Um, so my Christmas story is gonna require a little bit of letting you in on a Brig Brigant's family tradition. It's a tiny little thing that John, my husband, started when our older son Parker was his first Christmas. He was 10 months old. But we're the weird parents that will go in and wake the children up on Christmas morning. So if you imagine right now they're 26 and Ben, our younger, is 21, co recent college graduate, by the way. <laughs> Gay God. Um, so don't imagine they're grown up selves because that will probably be a grumpy moment. 
Imagine their toddler selves, their little bitty um, toddler, early elementary selves as their mom and dad go in at probably like 4.30 in the morning, it's still dark, and we wake them up and we gather them at the top of the stairs on that very top landing. And my husband started doing this and I love his heart that he does this. I got my tissue because I always cry. But he scoops those boys up in his big arms and he says, boys, it's Christmas. But what's magic about this day is not the presents you may or may not have. It's not the food you may or may not get. It's the fact that you were loved. You are loved so deeply by your mom and dad, by your grandparents, by your whole family, but most important, you are loved by great big God in heaven who loved you so much he sent his son to be a baby in a manger, today is the day we celebrate love coming down. And I'll have you know, those little boys, I would love to say they absorbed it very seriously, but no, they wiggled. It was Christmas morning, think Labrador Retriever. They wiggled, and it was so joyful watching that as a parent, watching that spirit of excitement and joy just come over them and getting to to sit with them as he did that, and we charged through the day. So now I'm gonna ask you to join me in 2004 And my first Christmas memory, or exciting Christmas memory, happened then, and it was significant to me because it was the year I became a Christ follower. It was the year that I became a true disciple of Christ. And I think I've shared with y'all before that um, that happened here at this church. I came in as a seeker of purpose, meaning, and truth. And through that year, I became a believer. And some women who had traveled those roads with me invited me to something called a a Jesse Tree Advent Study. I didn't know what it was, but it turns out we gathered together and each of us was assigned a symbol that corresponded with the devotion days one through 25. So we claimed our symbol, we went off to the craft store and replicated enough of our own symbol so everyone could have one. And they were wrapped as a present and then we numbered them and we got together and each of us walked away on that second meeting with a symbol, one through 25, and we walked away with a devotional book that that told the significance of each of the symbols. So our family walked through this that year, and it was a beautiful book. It had a really deeper adult application, and it had the, the child's application. So we were all learning at the level we were ready, but it was so, so powerful walking through that season. And by the time I got to December 24th here at Christmas Eve, sitting right over here on row three, Um, we stood and worshiped and I think the significance of the season fell on us in a fresh way. For me, certainly a fresh way. But everyone with me, we were were feeling it because we'd been through this study. The third song, the final song, before Will took the stage to share the Christmas message with us was, Oh Holy Night. So imagine having just walked through this moment of Advent And hearing this song, I am not gonna sing it for you. You can thank me later. I am gonna read it for you. Oh, holy night, the stars are brightly shining. It is the night of the dear Savior's birth. Long lay the world in sin and error pining till he appeared and the soul felt its worth. A thrill of hope, the weary world rejoices for yonder breaks a new and glorious morn, fall on your knees. Oh, hear the angel voices, O oh, night divine, O oh, night when Christ was born. Friends, that fell on me so hard that I was just, tears were happening here at church, couldn't sing, just cried. John stood next to me understanding and held me close, probably a little choked up too. It was so power, and and what came into sharp focus for me was this long, long season of waiting, and then on the scene, here comes God, fulfilling the promises that he had promised through thousands of years of history. I need you to know something. The following Christmas morning, and this is why it really came together for me as a powerful memory, I was just as excited as my boys. I was just as delighted in in the fact that today is the day we celebrate all of that and that joy of Christ coming down, love coming down. It was a beautiful, beautiful moment because friends, I knew something new. 
the Israelites had waited. So, so many stories throughout the Old Testament of their waiting, of their longing, of their suffering, waiting on this Messiah. From the time that Adam and Eve left the garden through the Israelites being in an Egyptian captivity for 400 years to wait for Moses to lead them out of that captivity and they wandered that desert for 40 more years. The Old Testament even comes to a close. The curtain falls on, after Malachi on silence. The 400 years of silence before an angel appeared to the shepherds. Luke 2 10 through 14 says this, and the angel said to them, fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy and will be for all people. For unto you this day in the city of David, a savior who is Christ the Lord, and this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling cloths, lying in a manger, and suddenly... There was with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God, saying, glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill with whom those he's pleased. Imagine, have you ever waited? Have you ever longed for something in your deepest heart? Have you ever waited for a child to join your family or your prodigal child to return? Have you ever waited for a spouse to join your life or prayed for a marriage, a healing hand on your marriage? Have you ever prayed for a physical healing? Have we ever prayed for a vaccine? We're all waiting. And what can waiting look like for us? Because waiting can be really difficult. It can send us on an emotional roller coaster up and down. We can feel sad, alone, misunderstood. Who? can understand the torment of waiting. So we hold it close. And then ultimately, the waiting room can leave us spiritually weary. Today, I'm gonna unpack for you the lesson that stood out to me from my favorite Christmas memory. And it, it came so hard and so fast that I have to believe it was God. So I have to believe that someone, someone needs to hear this so I approach you humbly to talk and to say and to ask our question, what if we could wait like children on Christmas morning for whatever that thing it is? What if we waited with joyful, bright-eyed, Labrador Retriever puppy wiggly anticipation? We know our good, good father is moving in the heart in our lives, in our diagnoses, for our prodigal, for our children, for our deepest heart desire? And what if we learned to wait with the thrill of hope? After all, Romans 8.28 tells us this, and it, you won't see a slide for this, but he tells us it all works out for good for those who love and trust the Lord. It doesn't say it's gonna be easy, and it doesn't say it's gonna be quick, but if we love and trust the Lord, our waiting will work out for good. To go deeper here, I need to quickly tell you a story, and I'm not gonna dwell here this long, but my waiting, my specific lesson from my waiting room started about eight years ago, and it started with a diagnosis. I had to have a surgery, and I was happy to have it, but what it would mean is that my left ear would be completely destroyed. Um, the surgeons would have to travel through that ear in order to access a tumor as, as easy and with as um, small of a risk to my life to get this tumor out. My husband, John, and I were like, okay, if that's the best way and the, and the safest way, let's do it. I, after all, I have two good ears. Turns out, through diagnostic testing to prepare me for surgery, I did not, in fact, have two good ears. I had one good ear, and it was the one we were about to destroy. You see, my, my right ear that I'd be left with had what my ENT called messy hearing. I would be able to hear high frequency and low frequency, but I had very little hearing in that mid-range frequency. That's the frequency that we hear a human voice. So it would be very, very difficult with this messy hearing. And so he got to work with his audiologist and they designed this state-of-the-art incredible hearing aid system. So I would be able to adapt 
praise God that surgery went well. My, my um, time of recovery was beautiful. So many miracles happened around this time that, that I told my friend Tony Colvin that I walk out of that season thinking of it as a period of blessing in my life. He said, you shouldn't tell people that. You sound crazy. But it was. It was amazing. So I fast forward a year and a half, and I was in a very different place. You see, I had not adapted well. My hearing was a mess. I was super frustrated in meetings. I felt like I, it was impeding my ministry, but it also was impeding time with my family. On my birthday, we went to a restaurant, and it was at my favorite restaurant, but it was so loud that I could not participate in the conversation at all. Think about what that does to a mother's heart when you can't participate with your family. I was so, so low. It was probably the darkest day for me and I went to bed praying, God, I've done everything I know to do. I've worked tirelessly with this audiologist. I've tried with and without the hearing aids. I've done everything I know to do and I'm done. I'm finished, I don't have anything else so can you show me what I need to do next? The next day was ACF staff meeting, which is a great time. Um, It's a once a month meeting that we all have. And um, at, at the end of the meeting, Will came up to me with a question. He had been in Canada teaching at a prayer conference. And he said, uncomfortably, a little shifty in his shoes, he said, the Lord tapped me on the shoulder and called me out for not praying for your hearing. Would you mind if we gathered together and prayed for your hearing? Wasn't this an answer to my prayer the night before? How incredible is that, that the very next day, God told me what my answer was. It was not another visit with the audiologist. It was gathering people together to pray for my hearing, right? He answered prayer right there. So we did, we, we started, and um, it, was, it was very, very um, scary because then we didn't have the prayer culture at ACF that we have now. This felt very foreign to me, but I had cried out and I had received my answer. So I had to trust it. Um, before I talk about this journey, I'm gonna give you four lessons that I've learned from this waiting room. Before I start, I need to tell you the overarching lesson that I've learned is waiting is active. We do not sit still in the waiting room. We are engaged, we are full force, we are present. It is not a latent, let's just lay back and see what happens. It's watchful, it's alert, and it's attuned. The other disclaimer that I have, and and I see many faces in this room that will probably shout out amen, I am not a great waiter. I do not wait well. I oftentimes will join my Israelite brothers and sisters wandering in that desert complaining about the manna. So what I need you to hear me say is this is not a natural go-to for me. This, these are lessons learned that God has been very sweet to show me. The first thing that Will called us to do is lesson number one, Gather your garden friends. He reminded me of the scripture in James, James 5, 14, that says, is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church. Let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And we did. We called the elders together, but Will said, call some more people together, your people. I am a blessed human, and I have a lot of people that I could call to invite into this. So, so instead of leaning on my own understanding in this, I prayed, who are the people I'm supposed to invite? Immediately, four names, four faces of friends came to my mind. The interesting thing about this mix of women is that we were not a posse. We did not travel together, the five of us. But I had a very unique and special, deep relationship with each of them. I was honored to death because I called and said, "Uh, we're gonna do this prayer meeting, will you come? And they all jumped on it and they said yes. Little did we know that that was a Gilligan's Island ask because we thought that was one prayer meeting. Six years, eight months later, we still are meeting once a month. 
That is a Gilligan's Island ask. God has moved a few of my garden friends to different areas, but they will continually reach me and say, I'm still praying for you in your hearing. I think when we, uh, we've heard Will refer to this term garden friends, he, he had a beautiful, beautiful message on that a few weeks ago. I encourage you, if you did not listen, to listen to that message. It was very, very encouraging. And one of the things that we learn about garden friends is that they're there to keep you out of a discouragement ditch. And when you're doing something so uncomfortable for your norm and you're, you're doing something so otherworldly, it's real easy to fall into the doubt and the frustration and the hurt, right? Those garden friends are the ones that miraculously know when those moments are and they reach out to you and they pull you back up. They keep you out of that desert. They're so important, but the unexpected fruit of the garden friends, the unexpected in that has been each of those four women, I told you we were not a posse and I'm not sure why God said these four women. It turns out each of them is in a waiting room of their own. And so praying together, all of their hearts, desires, and dreams come pouring out. And we're praying together for the Lord. And so the Lord will move their lives. One of them has received the desire of her heart and we got to be there and witness it. Encouragement comes through celebrating his miracles with others. So the garden friends are a critical step. Number two, lesson number two. Set your focus. You have to set your focus on the Lord in this, not on that thing you're praying for. And let me tell you, setting focus is hard. It takes discipline. It takes, it takes constant vigil, watchful eyes on making sure you have this right God is here, the thing you're praying for is there. There are no quality relationships built in the five unhurried moments we have in the morning before our day starts. It doesn't happen, time has to be spent focused, devotion. Think about it this way, if if you're a single person and you've met someone that you're interested in, you're not gonna develop that relationship in the five minutes of texting a day. That relationship's going nowhere. It requires vigilance. It requires care and nurturing to flourish. You aren't gonna see this slide, but but Psalm 37, four says this, delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. It's not flipped. It's not flipped. Get what you want and then say thank you. No, we delight first. We delight first. Here's what happens. If you start focusing on this idol, it becomes an idol, right? It's, it's usurped God in your life. I don't see any scripture that supports that that is honoring the Lord. I see quite the opposite. And what I know to be true is that when you've made an idol of that thing, when that's your sole focus, that's the enemy's playground In the book of John, Jesus teaches us the thief comes to steal, lie, and destroy. The thing he wants more than anything is to mess this up. He wants to get in the middle of that relationship and destroy your love and relationship with Jesus. Don't let it happen. If you pursue God while you wait, you'll find him you'll see yourself growing in his wisdom. You'll see yourself growing into things that he has for you as you journey together in the waiting room. God has many more miraculous lessons than you can even think of or imagine. He's got it there and it's in the waiting room. I, I, I struggle to kind of help I mean, this is a spiritual strengthening I'm talking about. It's a daily strengthening. I did find a video, if production could tee up the video, that shows a physical daily thing. I I'm, I'm mean it to be spiritual, but I, I hope you guys enjoy this video.
I mean, come on. How about that? That's what I'm talking about. That is what I'm talking about on the spiritual level. Isaiah 40, 31 says this, but they who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not be faint. We have to run to the Lord. We have to trust his process in our lives and in that waiting. Lesson three, see his movement. Colossians 4, 2 says, continue steadfastly in prayer, being watchful in it with thanksgiving. Watch for it. Because just as we are not supposed to be inactive in our waiting, we can't expect that the Lord is either. He's moving. We have to become watchers of his action. We may not even see him moving in our lives, but we see him moving in our garden friends' lives. Watch for him. Uh, Bible teacher and speaker Beth Moore said this recently, sometimes a miracle materializes slowly, like a gift, the unrushed God of all creation unwraps for you an inch at a time. She talks in, in, in this time about a long awaited for miracle and, and she doesn't tell us what it is but she does say the wonder of her wonders was what took God so long. And then she wraps it up by saying time is God's to take. He knows what he is doing. He knows what he is doing. He's moving, he's active. A biblical example of this or historical actually example of this, and I'm not gonna take us too deep in these weeds, um, but there is a period of time that I talked about earlier. It's, it's at the end of Malachi, the curtain closes on the Old Testament. Jesus' ministry does not happen for 400 years, and, and so we turn the page and there's the New Testament. Scholars and theologians call these the silent years, the silent era, the dark era. But if you look in history, it was not still. There was a lot of movement. Um, as we close in Malachi, Persians are dom Persian power is dominating the known world. Pretty soon, here comes a young man named Alexander the Great, and he changes things. All of a sudden, Greek control, the Greek Greece powers control the known world. And he wanted to hang on to that power and his, his philosophy for how to do that was to spread Greek culture. And, and the best way to do that is to spread the language. And so Kone Greek became the common language throughout all the world. Alexander uh, passed and other dictators and conquerors rose and fell until we get to the New Testament and Rome is in power of the known world. Their philosophy for hanging on to that world domination was Pax Romana, which meant peace for Rome. And the way they were gonna do it, they already had the common language, but they were gonna do it through uh, military power. And in order to get those military forces deep into the region of the known world, they had to create a system of roadways and highways and shipping channels and they had their military positioned all throughout the world. Think about that. Suddenly we have an Old Testament that has been translated into a, a language that everybody knows. Jesus is born, he rises in his ministry, he's crucified. Three days later he rises again continuing to teach, continuing to inspire. And the next thing you know, we just studied it in Acts, there is an explosion of the good news spreading throughout the world. They all had common language, so that wasn't a barrier. They all had roadways and systems to get to the far reaches of their known world. So those missionaries were able to go 
and they had military presence that kept them safe. God was not quiet and still during those 400 years. He was full of activity, and he made sure the good news of Jesus Christ spread like wildfire. We may not see what he's doing and understand what he's doing, but friends, we can trust him that he is working, he is doing it. Isaiah 64, three through four says this, when you, did an awesome, when you did awesome things that we did not look for, you came down. The mountains quaked at your presence. From old, no, no one has heard or perceived by the ear or eye has seen a God beside you who acts for those who wait. In addition to trusting he is at work because we see it all throughout the Bible, there's, there's a dynamic that has happened in my waiting room that I love, and I call them love notes. Some people, the Hallmark Channel in particular, calls them God winks. But there are these notes and messages that you start seeing and receiving from God as you do these hard things, as you wait. Um, a random text or a YouTube video on someone who's regained hearing after 20 years of prayer, those will come from my garden friends. Encouragement at the times when I need it the very most. They know. They know. One of my favorite stories is I left a meeting and it was a big meeting and, and it was hard to navigate and hear through it and I was really discouraged and I left it and I was get re getting ready to come back here to church and I had this thing, this urge inside of me to go to this Christian bookstore I'm like, I don't need anything there. I'm going back to work. Well, it did not cease. It kept growing and growing that I needed to go to this store. I was like, okay. So I went to this store really with nothing to buy. I walk in and they said, how can we help you? And I said, wish I knew. No idea why I'm here. So I literally wandered around the store and there in the Bible section is no other than Will Davis Jr. And, and I looked at him, I'm like, what are you doing here? And he had, this is gonna kill you, he had been visiting one of his pastor friend's church in Houston. And he had been talking to their congregation about prayer and the importance of prayer. And he, and he talked to them about healing prayers that were going on for me, for our friend Kennedy, for our friend Joni, many, many, many people that we were praying healing prayers for. And he said, I've been praying for your pastor's daughter. I need to, to hand that mantle to you. I need someone in this congregation to stand up and own that prayer movement in your church. And bless her heart, a woman stood up and he gave her his Bible. So he was at the bookstore replacing the Bible. Isn't that amazing? And I just looked at him and shook my head. I said, I just crawled out of a meeting so depressed and so sad and so discouraged in here you are. God pays attention. The other thing that happens, and this is crazy, the other thing that happens every time we pray, and remember, we've been praying six years, eight months, every month on average. My left ear, nothing else, my left ear, every single time, swells up with that pressure that you need to pop your ear when you're on an airplane, and it gets hot, and there's a deep, deep throbbing pain, sometimes a sharp pain, every single time. And we accept that as God's promise that we are on the right track and we're doing the right thing. And we praise him and we worship him and thank him for that, that nugget of reminder that he's in this with us. Lesson four. Prepare your heart. We need to prepare our hearts. I'm gonna take us back to Luke. And suddenly, there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace among those with whom he is pleased. It's gonna happen suddenly. We have to be ready for it. It's going to happen suddenly. John 16, says this, so also you have sorrow now, 
but I will see you again and your hearts will rejoice and no one will take your joy from you. I will see you again. You see, when I asked before, have you ever waited? The truth is, if you call yourself a Christ follower, we are all waiting. We are all in a waiting room together and it is so important that we get this right. Those who are not following Christ are looking to us for our examples. And when we travel through a year like 2020, we have an opportunity to make a difference and show them what it looks like to follow Jesus and to wait on his return. What would happen if they saw us in the way that we moved in our lives and saw that we encountered everything with a thrill of hope because we know our good, good father is gonna work it all out for good? What difference could we make in the lives of people? I'm gonna invite my friend Megan up um, from our worship team, and, and while I do that, I'm gonna remind you of where we've been in this series. We have been with Will under the canopy of the first heaven looking at stars as a reminder that God is there and hope is there. And his assignment for us was to get outside where there's no light pollution and see the canopy for ourselves. Susie took us through a, a beautiful memory of a young mother holding her heart's desire, her firstborn at Christmas time, and took us on a journey about the four stages of a Christian's life and how it's so important that we transition the stage as well and, and encourage us to gain a hallelujah heart as we transition. And today, I want you to walk away knowing how important it is to do these steps. Gather your garden friends. Keep your eyes on the Lord. Watch for him in his movement and prepare your hearts to celebrate like crazy and to walk away from this talk knowing the importance of waiting with a thrill of hope. I believe if we do this, if we encourage each other, I think that even it can change us. So my challenge, my assignment for you is to tell your people your stories. Ask God what was significant about that in 2020. Challenge you, challenge them, and each other share your stories about Christmas and what it's meant to you and the power of this season. And I think by doing that, we will be a people that will emerge, emerge even Christmas 2020 with the joy, excitement, anticipation, and the thrill of hope. Thank you.
was born Oh night divine Oh night Oh night divine Truly he taught us to love For the slave is a brother, and in his name all oppression shall cease. Sweet hymns of joy in grateful chorus raise we, let all within us is the Lord. Oh, praise his name forever. His power and glory evermore proclaim. Megan, we like to say here at Austin Christian Fellowship um, that if you want to know more about Christ, all you have to do is ask. You just have to ask, and I hope you will right now. Um, A stands for acknowledge the rule and reign of God. S stands for seek out the people of God and let them, seek out your garden friends and let them be with you. And K simply means keep your eyes on Jesus, and you do that through the church and through the word of God and through prayer. If you text ASK, A-S-K, to 512-866-9908, we will respond to you immediately with ways to know the Christ better. Wow. What a service. God bless you guys out online. Um, we'll see you hopefully either virtually here in live person, uh, in live person 
Christmas Eve, and then next year. God bless you guys.